the past two decades, the cost of sequencing has dropped dramatically. Over here is a chart showing you how much it costs to sequence 1 million bases of DNA. When the Human Genome Project completed in 2001, it cost uh, almost uh, $10,000. Today, we are approaching one cent to sequence a million bases of DNA, which represents a one million fold drop in the cost of sequencing. And if you follow this chart, you can see that there are several inflection points in 2007, uh, 2010 and 2015 where prices had some fairly steep drops and these were largely driven by new sequencing systems introduced by Illumina, the dominant player in the next-gen sequencing market. On this slide are three different types of sequencers from Illumina. They actually have several more, but they really span the, the scale of sequencing that's being offered. On the left-hand side is the Illumina MySeq instrument. In the middle is the HiSeq, and on the right is the NovaSeq, the newest high-output sequencer from Illumina. And if we compare the output of these machines uh, and compare them with the Sanger sequencing platforms, we can see just how much more sequence we can generate from these instruments. If you just look at how many reads you can get from a single run, the MySeq generates 30 million reads, the HiSeq generates 3 billion reads, the NovaSeq generates 13 billion reads, while the Sanger sequencing system generates uh, about uh, 400 reads. And so it's a huge difference. And if you just look at this in terms of how much sequence you can generate in a single day, uh, you can generate uh, up to 4 trillion bases on the NovaSeq in one single day, uh, compared to 1 million bases on a traditional Sanger instrument. Illumina sequencing is the dominant player in the market. It's an imaging-based method uh, and generates many, many reads, millions to billions of reads per run. And from each of these reads, we can generate 300 to 600 bases of sequence. It's really, really accurate. The error rate is roughly one in 1,000 bases. And with the new machines, we can actually sequence a human genome for $1,000 in less than 48 hours. And the sequencing on these Illumina platforms happens in flow cells. These are essentially microscope slides with channels on the inside. What I have shown here is a MySeq flow cell next to a standard Eppendorf tube that's used for a lot of uh, lab work. And these tubes are pretty small, about one and a half inches in height. And on this MySeq flow cell, we can generate about one to 30 million reads per run. Next up is the HiSeq flow cell. You can see it's quite a bit larger than the MySeq flow cell, and this larger real estate allows us to generate more reads in a single run, approaching 3 billion reads. And lastly is the NovaSeq flow cell, which is even larger. And on this flow cell, we can generate 13 billion reads in a single run. So you can't just put DNA into these flow cells and get sequences out. You actually have to prepare your sample. And so there are several steps that occur, but basically what happens is you take your sample that you want to sequence, which is DNA. If you have something like RNA, you can convert it with enzymes into DNA. You take that DNA and then you have to add on these adapter sequences at the end. So in blue are primer binding sites uh, that allow the sequencing reaction to occur. This is similar to Sanger sequencing where we needed to have a primer bind for DNA polymerase to move along the template DNA. And then we also have these capture sequences in green and orange. And these allow your sequencing sample to be captured onto the flow cell for sequencing. Once you have your DNA sample prepared, it's a double-stranded molecule which we denature and put into the flow cell. And on the left-hand side, again, is a picture of the HiSeq flow cell. So there are eight channels, and samples actually go into the glass slide. There are eight different channels within there. And inside of the slide um, are a mixture of short DNA um, molecules in orange and green. And these orange and green molecules will bind to both ends of your sequencing library. So we denature our sample, flow those into the flow cell, and they can get captured by these primers or these short DNA molecules on the surface of the slide. And once that occurs, a DNA polymerase is added and the DNA building blocks introduced, and we copy that template. And so we have a newly synthesized strand that's now physically constrained to the bottom of the flow cell. We wash out the original template strand and then allow the newly synthesized strand to now bind onto the other DNA sequence present on the surface, in this case, the orange piece. And then we flow in some DNA polymerase and building blocks and we get another strand formed. And we repeat this process many, many times. And in the end, we get about a thousand copies uh, within a cluster. 
and remember that these thousand molecules all came from the same original template strands, so they all have the same sequence. We denature the strands, and then we can selectively cleave off one of the oligos, or the primers, in this case, the green one. And we've washed those away, so now all the thousand molecules present are all the identical strand, because we removed the other strand. We flow in a sequencing primer, and now the clustering process is complete. And this is the instrument that performs clustering. So first thing we do is we take a brand new flow cell. Again, this is the size of a standard microscope slide. And then we put it onto the stage of the instrument. And the stage is a, is a region of the instrument that can actually heat and cool to perform a lot of the enzymatic reactions. Next, we load a blue plate of the reagents that perform the clustering. And lastly, a strip tube with the eight different samples that are gonna be loaded onto that flow cell. Next, a manifold is mounted on top of the flow cell and connected to the C-bot. And in the back of the C-bot or this clustering instrument are a series of pumps that will now pull reagents from the blue reagent plate or from our sample strip tube and pass them through the flow cell. And this is how reagents and, and liquids are delivered. And at this point, the clustering procedure uh, takes about three to four hours. And once that's done, we take that flow cell and move it on to the actual sequencer, in this case, a HiSeq instrument. And on the HiSeq instrument, we have a refrigerated compartment for all the sequencing reagents. A lot of enzymes in there that need to be kept cool during the three to four day sequencing run. Above the refrigerated section is a series of pumps that pull reagents from that refrigerated compartment and send them to the flow cell which we will now load onto the stage. And so that is the flow cell from the CBOT that just completed clustering. This gets mounted onto a stage and locked in place. And then we can begin the sequencing run. And what that does is that will trigger the pumps to start flowing reagents from the refrigerated compartment into the flow cell. And behind the flow cell is actually a really powerful microscope. Uh, that is used to actually sequence each of those molecules of DNA. And so remember that when we put the flow cell onto the sequencer, this is what it looks like. We have a lot of clusters uh, that each have a sequencing primer bound to them. And the chemistry for sequencing is very similar to the Sanger sequencing uh, terminators that were used, but the one difference is that these are reversible. And so they're reversible in, in two ways. So first, these can get incorporated into the clusters by DNA polymerase, and those clusters will light up in four different colors depending on which base gets incorporated. A picture is taken, and after that picture is taken, we can actually remove these terminators and the fluorescent groups with some chemicals. And what results is we regenerate the three prime hydroxyl groups, so now that cluster can have another round of bases added to it. And so this is what it looks like uh, for a single molecule. On this end over here, we have our template strand bound to a sequencing primer. And this allows DNA polymerase to bind and then add a base. In this case, it's a yellow one. So once this gets added, a picture is taken. And then we add chemicals to remove the fluorescent group and the terminator so that DNA polymerase can add a second base. An image is taken, chemistry is performed to remove that base and to regenerate the 3' hydroxyl. And then we can add another base. And so over time, the cycle just repeats over and over again with multiple cycles of a base addition, imaging, and then chemistry to remove the blocks. And so if we look at, take a look at this depiction of five different cycles, so each of these uh, represents a different image taken. And if we follow the top left and the bottom right clusters and see how those colors changes over time, we can actually build the sequence. So the top cluster, the sequence is gonna be A, G, C, C, T, because it goes from yellow, blue, red, red, green. And the bottom one is G, T, A, A, C. And so again, the power of the system is that you can sequence up to billions of sequences at the same time in parallel. And this is what gives these instruments their throughput. So some people ask me, why can't we increase the amount of bases that we get in a single read by just repeating the chemistry over and over again, do this a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand times? And the main reason why is that the enzymes and chemistries aren't perfect. So over here, I have a cluster, a one single cluster 
uh, made out of the same template molecules. But what happens is, because chemistry isn't perfect, um, some of the strands lag behind. So this one is a yellow instead of a green. And some clusters jump ahead. So this one is now a red instead of a green because it hopped ahead. And what happens is these errors aren't too bad, but over time and many, many cycles over the course of 100, 200, 300 cycles, uh, more and more strands start to lag and more start to jump ahead so that your true signal starts to disappear and gets weaker and weaker. And this really limits Illumina sequencing to about 300 bases for, for each read. So with the Illumina sequencer, four different images are taken during each cycle, one for each of the four color bases. And so the images actually look like this. They're not very clear, they're not perfect circles, and they're very difficult to, to see by eye, to figure out where one cluster starts and another begins. You know, one example is here. Let's say in the first cycle, we have two clusters that are both G. These just look like a single blob that's a single color, and this is really hard for the sequencer to pick out. But because we're sequencing many, many sequences at a time in parallel, chances are these aren't identical sequences. And if we go through another cycle, you know, chances are that they'll have a difference. So now this cluster on the right is an A, while the cluster on the left is still a G. But because of this, the sequencer can now compare these images and determine where cluster A has a very pure signal, where there's a mixture between cluster A and B, and where cluster B has a pure signal. And it'll decide to just take imaging information from just these clean areas where they have very pure signal. So again, this is four color chemistry from Illumina. This is what had been used for, for many, many years. And it was very clear and obvious, one color for each of the four bases. But there are issues with this. So the colors depicted here, you know, you can tell the colors are very, very different. However, if you actually look at the emission spectra, you can see there's significant overlap between the four colors. And this requires the instruments to undergo a lot of color compensation, and this can contribute to errors. So a few years ago, Illumina introduced two color chemistry. So instead of using four colors to represent four bases, they're now using two colors to represent four bases. In this case, they're using red and green. And the way this works is that you have uh, T's, which are green, C's, which are red, A's, which are actually a mix of both colors, so you'll see them in both images, and then G's actually have no color or no signal. And so this is how you can encode uh, four different bases with only two colors. And so initially the quality of the two-color chemistry wasn't as great as the four-color chemistry, but recent developments on the NovaSeq platform, one of Illumina's newer sequencers that uses two colors, uh, the data quality actually rivals the four-color instruments. And so there's definitely been some improvements in this area. The other benefit of two-color sequencing is that these reagents are generally cheaper to make because you don't have to have as many colors, and the instruments are also less expensive because you only have to capture two images instead of four. So how far can you take this? Can you do sequencing with only a single color? And the answer is yes. A newer platform just released by Illumina uh, uses a single color uh, to encode four different bases. And they do this by taking two images that are separated by a chemistry step in the middle. So I'll walk you through this. In the first image, um, they add the four different bases. And in this case, the A's and T's have a color on there. And again, it's the same color the C's and G's don't have any color. One thing to note is the A base has a cleavable linkage between the base and the color. And the C base has a, a molecule that we can use to attach something later on. So we take an image first, so A's will have color and T's will have color. C's and G's will not have any color. Next, we go through a chemistry step uh, that will cleave the green color from the A bases, and it'll add a molecule that will bind to the C bases and make them now colored. And so we take a second image. So in the second image, A's won't have any color because any that did had them cleaved off. The G's still won't have any color, but both the C's and T's will have color. And what this looks like if you break this down is if you compare a single cluster and look at its color, whether it's on or off between image one or two, you can get four different bases out. So these are the different flavors of Illumina sequencing. We started off with four color chemistry, moved to two color chemistry, and now we have one color chemistry. All these chemistries are still used currently on existing platforms and each of them have, uh, have their benefits.